This is, this is maybe the most obvious thing ever. But when I heard somebody say this, I thought, actually, that's really helpful. Everything in the Bible is written after the events of Genesis 3. Right? Duh. Right? So it, everything's written in a fallen world, and everything's written after the promise of Genesis 3.15. Obviously, because that was before the book was written. So you know, it's kind of obvious. But actually, what that means is... This is a fallen world, a fallen humanity, and God has purposed, he has a plan to send the male child of the woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent. So that promise, in the context of that fallenness, is already established before anything's written. Which means that everything that's written, in some way, is redemptive. Okay, that doesn't mean that every detail of what's written is like a, uh, a little seed that gives you everything. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you can pick a verse at random and if you know the clever tricks then you can show that actually uh, the, if you knew this in the Hebrew the, the words spell the word cross. I'm not talking about weird stuff. I'm just saying that within the broad sweep of scripture the whole thing is God's revelation of his plan to rescue a fallen humanity. All right, and some, some things are really obvious and really easy. Some things you kind of scratch your head a bit and go, what do I do with this? Okay, and that's kind of what we're going to wrestle with is how do we legitimately do it? Because it's easy to make up a jump to Jesus. It actually doesn't take that much skill. It impresses people, but it doesn't take any skill to make up magic leaps to Jesus. But instead to think, okay, what's the most effective way to show how this passage is heading towards that. That's, that's what we want to think about. So I mentioned depra uh, depravity factor, that's Robinson's term, and fallen condition focus, that's Brian Chappell's term. What those two from both schools, uh, the big story, big idea guys, what they're saying is, because everything's written after Genesis 3, that means that within the narrative, within the story, within what's going on, there's going to be something there that focuses us on the fallenness. There's going to be something there that's kind of um, an indicator of the problem. Does that make sense? So you're, you know, you're looking at the story of Joseph and his brothers, well, sibling rivalry. You know, or you're looking at... Um, I don't know, there's a different story in the Old Testament and, and you see the kind of tendency of the character to trust in their own plans. David fixing the mess. You know, there's all these different facets of fallenness manifesting. And actually you can't find any story where there's any human other than Jesus, obviously, where there isn't some sense of the fallenness being manifested. And therefore, that's going to be the connection point for us as a preacher or a teacher to say, Look at what's going on here. Even within its context, in some way, that's pointing us to the fact that God is the solution. God is the answer. So Brian Chappell often says the phrase, look for ways in which God does for people or what God does for sinners that people cannot do for themselves. How is God being God? How is God being a gracious God towards the undeserving? How is God doing for people what they cannot do for themselves? Okay, so there's a richness to that. It's not a secret code or a magic leap. It's, it, there's a richness of God always being consistent with himself in dealing with people. And as we know, we are consistent with our fallenness. And so there's always going to be some point of intersection. And the challenge is how do we get to that? So if we move on to... Um, approaches to redemptive exposition. This is probably the session where I, I kind of need to to walk through written notes the most. I slightly apologize for that. I'd never preached that way, but uh, I think it's uh, it, we want to kind of lay the foundation, have the options. This is where I'm going to give us a menu, if you like, of approaches so that we can go from a text to uh, to you know, the, the redemptive emphasis. Um, 
and I, I kind of want to make sure I, I, I get it right. I don't want to sort of give you a vague summary and then you look at the notes and go, oh, these, I don't get how he said it. Yeah, I, I want us to, to have what the notes give us. So redemptive preaching and honoring the text. All right, so just moving through these. There are numerous ways to preach redemptively. Okay, for some people that's a revelation because they think there's only one way to do it. There are numerous ways to preach redemptively. Okay, so we're not saying that every text will yield a direct reference to Christ or a clever revelation of the atonement. What we are saying is that since there is always a depravity factor to be seen in a text, and since God is the hero of every story in the Bible, including Esther, there will always be a textually legitimate way to preach the redemptive revelation of God's grace when you are preaching any passage. Okay, so it doesn't mean that every passage has to be done the same way. In fact, that's why I'm resisting that. I'm saying let's be sensitive to the specific passage that we're looking at and see what it gives us, what it yields. Okay, it doesn't have to, and it doesn't always give us everything that we might want. Okay, so letter B, there are some unhelpful and unnecessary ways to preach redemptively. Okay, so some people basically have the evaluative grid of, did the preacher tell me about Christ and him crucified? And if he did, he's a success. I like him. And if he didn't use the words Christ and crucified, heretic! You know, some people's kind of grid is so ridiculously simple that you go, oh, come on, are you sure? You know, that's, that's a little bit harsh. And so there are unhelpful and unnecessary ways. And, and my point is that sometimes people <coughs> preach Christ in a way that I think is really unhelpful. And yet, the people with the simplistic grid will be celebrating because they mention Jesus. And I, I want us to just be a bit more discerning than that. So, uh, we must learn how to handle the text as well as possible, learn how to teach the grace of God or preach the grace of God as effectively as possible so that we do not fall into the traps of undermining the text to preach our message. That's my biggest concern, is when we give up biblical credibility in order to gain gospel credibility. When we, when we kind of handle the Bible and then we throw out all the rules and then get to Jesus so that the people in the crowd who are going to be difficult if we don't are happy. You know, which actually is probably happening in some churches. One or two vigilantes that are ready to shoot you if you don't mention Jesus so the preacher forces a mention of Jesus. I think actually those awkward vigilantes need to be dealt with, not pandered to. Okay, so someone who is a Christian and has got an agenda and is just awkward can really get in the way of the work of the church. And it's much better to take them outside and have a little conversation rather than live in fear every Sunday and do what satisfies them when there's six other people sitting there who are looking at their Bibles going, I don't get how you, how, what, how did you do that? That makes no sense. You obviously don't treat the Bible seriously, or maybe I can't trust the Bible, and, you know, and I'm honestly much more concerned about the guests, the, the first-timers, the people who aren't saved yet, who are looking at their Bibles, or looking at the church Bibles, or whatever. I'm more concerned about them than the Christian who is going to get bent out of shape if you don't make everything just the way he wants it. Does that make sense? They control churches, and honestly, uh, it'd be better if we disciplined them than just give them what they want. Now, I would like to think that actually, if we do it well, they won't be a problem. All right, but there are ways that are not helpful, not necessary to achieve it. Let us see, always preach redemptively and always preach with biblical integrity. I said that already, that's the goal. It is possible to consistently handle the biblical text appropriately using good hermeneutical principles that will hold up under the scrutiny of our listeners and it is possible to consistently preach the redemptive message of God's grace for fallen sinners. We can do both at the same time. That is possible. We must do both at the same time. Now, when we sacrifice biblical credibility to proclaim a redemptive message of God's grace, we are undermining our listeners' trust in the communicative ability of God. Now, that's, that's my real concern there, so I'll just flag that up. 
We're undermining their trust in God's ability to communicate. And therefore, by extension, they're under, we're undermining their trust in God's grace too. We've got to see there's a connection. The fact that God communicates is because he's a gracious God. Right? There's, th- those are not two separate things. God communicates graciously to us. What a gift. And yet, if we try to show his grace, and in the process make people think he's not a very good communicator, we're, we're breaking something theologically. All right? Um, our listeners should not be scratching their heads trying to understand how we magically conjured up a message about Christ and the cross from a text that did not support the presentation we made. No matter how attractive that message may be, we are asking listeners to trust God's self-revelation while at the same time giving the impression that it cannot be trusted and it needs our creative and inventive eisegesis in order to impose our message. You know, you come across the word eisegesis? Exegesis is the process of study, right? Exegesis is where you bring out from the text its meaning. Uh, Ex in in Greek is out of. So the meaning is coming out of the text. That's exegesis. That's a big positive, right? Eisegesis is where we impose a meaning into it. We introduce something that isn't there. And so uh, in kind of academic type, uh, biblical studies books, theological books, inventive eisegesis is a bit of an insult. <laughs> All right? We do not want to be accused of that. And so uh, that sentence, I, I want to go back and review it. No matter how attractive the message may be, we are asking listeners to trust God's self-revelation. We're preaching from the Bible, trust that what I'm saying is true. At the same time, giving the impression that God's word cannot be trusted. <laughs> Ugh, that's do you see the problem with that? With the, God's word cannot be trusted and actually it needs us to be creative and to add things in order to say what it needs to say. Please will you trust this God who's not very good at communicating. You see the, the problem with that? And I'm, I'm saying we don't need to do that. We don't need to have uh, creative, uh, unique, um, silly, eisegetical, imposed ideas in order to preach the gospel the text itself is redemptive now it's going to maybe take more work to figure out how the text is redemptive than to do our little shortcut that's just a reality if if i if i said actually i'm going to say that that's legitimate i'm going to accept that i could prepare messages in about half an hour you know I know the Bible fairly well, I've been teaching it for a few years now, I don't need to study the background to have some vague awareness of it. And so pretty much anywhere in the Bible, okay, right, yeah, okay, now let me make a way to Jesus. Let me use my old favorite, you know. There's a person whose name begins with J in here. You know whose name begins with J who really matters, Jesus. Hey, now I get to preach my Jesus stuff again. I don't need to prepare those sermons. And the vigilante who's in the church goes, oh, I loved how you got to Jesus. And everyone else is going, what in the world was that? Yeah, so actually to say, oof, this is a tough one. How do I preach this one? <laughs> Lord, help me. I'm going to, you know, in the commentaries, I'm studying, I'm trying to understand it. There are some passages that don't just, you know, fall into your lap. Now, if you're preaching um, Psalm 110, and you're scratching your head wondering how to get to Jesus, then I'm a bit concerned. It's seven verses all about the Messiah, right? Psalm 2, fairly straightforward. But if you're in some places, you should be struggling. You should be thinking, how, how Lord, I don't, I don't know. How do I do that? I know that the, the Bible is post-fall, post-promise. It's all redemptive, but Lord, I'm struggling with this one. And it may be that instead of preparing sermons in half an hour, we need to do some work. I'm not opposed to that. I think actually that's a privilege, not a, not a negative. Okay, so it's vital that we handle the text well and that we carefully show how that specific text reveals, points to, or sets up some aspect of God's redemptive grace that is ultimately to be found in Christ himself. So let's do the work and let's do it well. I hope we all agree with that. So what is redemptive preaching? There are some common misconceptions of redemptive or Christ-centered preaching. Okay. Uh, Brian Chappell wrote Christ-Centered Preaching. 
talking to him, I, I got the distinct sense, and in fact he, he came out and said it, that he's had to live with people misunderstanding his book for years. Not people who read it so much, as people who just use the title. Okay, so he, he says, you know, I'll go to a place and I'm introduced as the guy who wrote Christ Centered Preaching. He's written other stuff, but that's the book that, you know, he's famous for. And people say, oh, you're that guy that thinks we should always, you know, and he's had to go, no, I, I really don't think that. Okay, so there are mis misconceptions. And I was, it was fun, I was chatting to him, I said, that's quite funny because I've had your book used against me by people who haven't read it, and I have. He said, I'm not surprised. <laughs> he said, that happens a lot. So what are we not advocating? I say we, him, and me, and others. What, what are we not saying? What are we not suggesting? First of all, in a very broad sense, allegorical preaching. Now, there are legitimate allegorical approaches. I'm not saying that all allegory is wrong. The Bible uses it. Uh, once, Galatians 4. So there is allegory in Scripture and there are legitimate ways to do allegorical preaching. But for some people that's just the shortcut. And sometimes it's an incredible stretch. It's just, here's the fast track to Jesus. And they take a detail and they allegorize it. They take it and the, take it out of its meaning and apply a new meaning to it. And they make the link that way. So we're not looking to use allegory or analogy to generate an appearance of Christ or a reference to Christ in every passage that we preach. That's not what Christ-centered preaching is about. Equally, we're not advocating antinomian preaching. And that's a label that, that gets used a lot. Antinomian means against the law, right, or against law. So uh, Luther, uh, reformational Lutheran type theology gets called as antinomian. I don't think that's fair. I mean, there's awkwardnesses there. Paul, the apostle, is being called antinomian by the Galatians. And so if someone calls me an antinomian, I take it as a bit of a compliment because I'm with Luther and Paul, among others, maybe even Jesus. But, um, but what, it, what the label tends to be used as, as, a, as an insult or an attack, is you believe that we preach Christ and we never preach instruction, right? You believe that there's no place for any expectation of morality. Or if people are being really nasty, you believe that we should sin. <laughs> you think, who says that? Actually, some do. You're pro-sin because you don't bash against sin all the time. You must be in favor of it. So we're not saying that there's no place for instruction or clarification of moral expectation for believers. How the law functions in the life of the believer is a larger subject. That's, maybe we should do that another year. That might be the year I get kicked out of the forum, though, so maybe not. Um, but whether we hold to a third use of the law theology or not, our goal is greater godliness, not greater godlessness. So if you don't know what third use is, don't worry. But, but hopefully everybody who's kind of in the top categories, big idea, big story, whatever approach they're taking, I hope that all of them certainly the trustworthy ones, they are pro-godliness. Right? There's nobody that's trying to get people to sin in good evangelical circles. Now, I think the effect of some people's ministry might be that people sin. Right? Sometimes just in response to the preacher. But sometimes the, the preaching doesn't help people to stop sinning. And that's why the, the stones get thrown. But it's a really unfair attack to say, oh, you believe in preaching redemptively or preaching Christ. You are just promoting sin because you're not preaching instruction. It's just, just a silly charge. It's just not helpful, not fair. Redemptive preaching seeks to motivate greater life change, not excuse greater sinfulness. Okay, so some people would say, because you don't focus on duty and law and pressure people, you must not th take sin very seriously. My response to that is, because you focus on duty and law and pressuring people, you don't even believe in sin. That really gets them annoyed. What do you mean I don't believe in sin? Well, if you knew how bad sin was, you wouldn't even think that people could fix themselves. Now, sin is a very serious matter, and I think you need to take it more seriously. Oh, you can't say that. I preach against sin every week. You know, so you can have fun with these people if you're careful, because you know, basically what, what that charge is, is 
because you are not condemning the younger brother in your preaching all the time, you must be in favor of us all being like younger brothers. And my response is, you sound an awful lot like the older brother. The older brother was very ready to condemn the younger brother, but he was oblivious to the fact that he was a sinner. You know, think about his charge. When you, you know Luke 15, the charge of the older brother when the father's entreating him, begging him to come in? He says, first of all, himself, righteous, I have served you all these years and you have not paid me properly. So he's got this twisted view of relationship with his father, just like his brother does, but he doesn't see that. And th when this son of yours goes off and spends everything on prostitutes, you welcome him back gladly. And so I'm condemning him, but I'm good. And actually, both of them are lost. It's just that one manifests his lostness in the far country like a sheep, and one of them manifests his lostness close to home like a coin. But they're both lost. And so sometimes the stone throwing that happens when people start using the label antinomian is really older brother to, to, uh, to a preacher saying, you've got to get them, you've got to condemn the behavior, you've got to get them to act like me. And, and I go, no, 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 no. You're not the epitome of godliness. You're not the goal. The goal is for both rebe rebels and religious. That's Keller's categories, isn't it? both the rebellious and the self-righteous, both the rebellious and the religious, for both to be brought into relationship because both are lost and sin is not just sins. Sin is also self-righteousness. And so usually when you hear people say, oh, this person advocates sin, this person's antinomian, usually it's because their view of sin is restricted to sins and they want to hear sins criticized. Okay? That's not a fair... Uh, label to apply to what we're talking about this week. I hope there's no point in what we say this week where you say, yeah, I knew it. He's pro-sin. <laughs> I, I, I hope not. I, I'm a sinner, but I'm not pro-sin, okay? So here's a definition. I put a short definition, then I wrote it, and then changed my title to a short-ish definition because it got quite long. <clears throat> so, since every passage is written in the context of a fallen world to fallen people, as part of the self-revelation of God whose grace is the answer to sin, therefore it is possible to preach every passage redemptively. So far so good? Complex sentence, but... In every passage we can point to the fallenness of humanity and the graciousness of deity. So the, the two sides of the problem, the problem and the solution, sin and grace, we can point to that in some way. In every passage we can show where it stands in relation to the grace of God revealed ultimately in the person of Christ. Because we've got to recognize, this is maybe within what I'm saying there, that as we're going through the Bible, there's a progression of revelation. We don't have everything up front. <coughs> Even Genesis 3.15, what do we know? The solution is going to be human. It's going to be male. It's going to defeat the serpent. It's going to suffer in the process. And God's got the plan. That's a lot of information. But there's a whole Bible worth we don't know yet, right? And then as you move forward, we discover more. It's going to be in the line of Shem, Genesis 9. In the line of Abram, Genesis 12. And you keep going and you, know, you discover it's not the first, it's the second. Not the first, it's the second. Not the first, second, third, it's the fourth. And you go through and there's revelation, revelation, revelation. We're getting information as we go, not just in terms of what line is this coming deliverer in. There's also... Uh, revelation gradually of what his role will be. Not just the serpent defeater, but he's the ultimate priest, he's the ultimate king, he's the ultimate prophet, and, and there's all of that, it's not in that order, but there's all of that anticipation building, and there's revelation all the way, and there's a progression of it. Okay, so I hope we don't need to argue against progressive revelation, because it's clearly there's more coming as we go on through the story. And Jesus comes, and, well, that's interesting. If you have eyes to see, he's, a, you know, the ultimate finale of that trajectory of revelation of God's gracious plan. Here he is. And so there's a progression in that, which means that in every passage along the way, uh, all the way through the process, it stands in relation to that flow. It, it's, it's within 
that story. We don't suddenly go off track and have a, a cul-de-sac about Egyptian religion, you know, as if it's something positive. No, it's all part of the story that's heading towards ultimately Christ. When we preach redemptively, we don't preach pressure on the listener. We preach the person revealed to the listener. That's the focus is not on the listener to perform or behave or change. It's, hey, look, it's a pointing to God. Uh, and I just put the person there. Uh, when we preach redemptively, we preach a personal God who is gracious to the undeserving. All right, this means that we are seeking to point to God's redemptive nature and God's redemptive plan. We're seeking to underline grace for the transformation of lives. Overtly or implicitly, we are preaching Christ as the ultimate revelation of God's gracious redemptive plan. That's always possible. All right, we're, if we're doing anything else than what that's describing, we're doing something that isn't biblical. Right? Even if I mean, we could be just doing a, a lecture on the kings of the southern kingdom. Okay, but you're lecturing, you're not preaching. They are part of the plan. There's some sense in which whether you point to Christ or you point to the character of God in that story, whichever way you go, it, there's, a, there's a preaching of Christ overtly or implicitly. Are we all tracking with this? We're kind of building our way till we get to the menu. All right? Okay, letter C, must Christ always be mentioned in redemptive preaching? This is where the vigilantes tend to appear, right? Because their simple mechanism is, I didn't hear the name of Jesus. Okay, so uh, here I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement, I think, with Brian Chappell, where he says, must Christ always be mentioned? He says, technically and theoretically, no. Technically, Jesus, the name, does not have to be mentioned. Technically, Christ, uh, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, who went to the cross at Calvary and rose on the third day, with all of the specificity of the Gospels, technically, Jesus does not have to be mentioned for preaching to be redemptive. So let's ponder that a little bit. Well, how? How? How is it possible to be redemptive without Christ? Well, if you remember that Christ is the ultimate revelation of God, God is being revealed at various times and in various ways all the way through. All right? Sometimes Christ is even appearing within that. But there are times where you've got people interacting with God's promise interacting with God's Word, living at the fork in the road between trusting God and trusting self. That's happening in every story. And sometimes Christ is not there in terms of explicit reference, explicit mention. Is it possible to preach a story or a passage and not mention Jesus and yet still be redemptive? I think, yes, it is. I agree that with chapel, yes, it is. So, for example, Isaiah 40... Let's say your passage is 40 verses 9 to 31, which is a real beautiful block of text. It begins with um, a voice calling out, um, saying to all the cities around uh, Zion, look up to Zion, behold your God. And then it goes on to this incredibly beautiful description of, of the God of, of the Israelites in terms of he's greater than the nations, he's greater than the princes of the nations, he's greater than the idols of the nations. He didn't have to consult anyone to make everything. You know, there's all of this description about Yahweh, right, about God without specificity that it's the second person of the Trinity or anything like that. Just Yahweh is greater than the nations, the princes, and the gods. Wow, what a God. Unless you think that we are just like grasshoppers, verses 27 to 31, lest, why do you say, O Jacob, my way is hidden from the Lord? Or, you know, why do you kind of go at the end there? Because 
Don't you realize he gives grace, he strengthens the weak. Those who look to the Lord will renew their strength. They'll rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and so on. And you get this beautiful conclusion where you discover, wow, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel is this great beyond words God, like beyond anything that we can compare. Who are we going to liken him to? No one. He's absolutely incomparably great and powerful and he created everything and the oceans are in the palm of his hand. And you've got all of that reality reality and it makes you feel kind of small but don't despair because he gives grace to those who trust him he strengthens those who are weak is it possible to preach that without preaching Jesus and the answer is technically theoretically absolutely because what God am I talking about I'm talking about the triune God of the Bible have I been redemptive in preaching it obviously I've given you a 30 second summary, I haven't given you a sermon, but within that sermon I'm going to be connecting that to us even today. You know, we need to know that God is greater than the superpowers in our world and he's greater than the nations, you know, China is rising and becoming scary, but God's bigger than that and, and all, you know, God's bigger than the gods of the nations, you know, some people are very scared about Allah, but God's bigger and, and, and yet, but don't, don't think that you're not important because he's strengthening and gracious and kind and and he reveals himself and there's all of this detail in that passage and I think you can preach that and you can preach it redemptively pointing people's hearts not to themselves but pointing them to God uh, and making them want to respond to him and it's redemptive preaching and Jesus has not been mentioned technically and theoretically it's not required but and this I think is a really important point pastorally why wouldn't you mention Jesus pastorally caring for people technically I, I'm happy to preach Isaiah 40 and not mention Jesus but pastorally why wouldn't I I mean it's not hard to see the connection even within its context right this great God who is being compared through chapters 40 to 48 with the silliness of of the gods of Babylon what do we get from that point on? Even within that section, 42, behold my servant. 49, there he is again. 50, 53, oh my goodness. Talk about the grace of the great God being demonstrated. It's just a few chapters away. You know, and so pastorally, if I'm preaching Isaiah 40 and I'm caring for my listeners, I don't have to preach Jesus and explicitly reference him, but actually, why wouldn't I? There may be somebody there, you know, it may be that I'm in a series and I'm working my way through Isaiah and I know that next week we're getting to chapter 42 and ooh, it's going to be a big surprise and it's going to be a big reveal, but I'm hinting at it, you know. But as a pastor, I'm thinking, some people may not live till next week, all right? Life, death happens. Some people are guests this week who won't be back next week. I don't want to just hint at something when actually they might not get the hint because they don't know their Bibles. So actually, I, if someone comes to me and says, Isaiah 40, would you mention Jesus? The fact that they're asking means that I'll say, nope, because I want to stand my ground and say it's possible not to. But actually, I'll follow up and say, uh, yeah, I probably would. <laughs> because pastorally, why wouldn't I? Why, when, it, when there's such a clear way to get there, why hold back? So you see the tensions that are at play in that. The second paragraph under that says, says something really important. Humans are not neutral. Okay, humans are not sitting there listening to sermons in this sort of state of neutrality where they take hints. I can be as a preacher overt and direct and positive and explicit and people can still miss my point. You may have noticed that when you preach, right? You just give your all to a message or to a lesson, and at the end of it, people go, oh, that was great. I was so helped by your illustration about golf. And you go, my illustration about golf? I wasn't even talking about golf. I was talking about baseball. Oh, my goodness. You know, people can miss what you're saying with incredible skill. And so humans are not neutral. We do not receive preaching with impartiality. Here's a phrase I use, fallen world gravity. The, the gravity in this world always pulls us towards fallenness. We can't help ourselves. Even in your most godly moments, 
you somehow start sliding towards independence, autonomy. It's just this pull that's constantly there. Fallen world gravity means that we always tend towards self-reliance. Right? It's just human nature, even among Christians. So the preacher preaches grace, but I tend to hear law, even if he isn't making it into a burden. <laughs> I can turn it into one. Have you ever felt that in yourself? Somebody preaches the wonders of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ and they've preached the cross and they've preached how undeserving we are and they've done a wonderful job of presenting how it's all him and none of me. Uh, and then at the end we go, oh, I've really got to try hard to remember that. <laughs> do, do you ever do that? That's, that's, that's our nature. Oh, that was amazing. I really hope I don't forget. Don't forget, don't forget. And we've turned it into a burden. And so people are doing that, okay? They will tend to hear burden. And since we tend to corrupt what we hear and make it about ourselves, why not be as overt with God's redemptive grace in Christ as we can be? It's not, it's not I'm saying it has to happen always. What I'm saying is, if it doesn't, why doesn't it? It's just a pastoral logic to it that if I spend my ministry being very careful to hint at grace in all that I say, but I choose not to be explicit, consistently, I'm probably not gonna achieve what I'm thinking I'm achieving. Because people will, will twist and corrupt even the most explicit thing. Now having said that, there are some passages where I think that to get to Christ and be explicit about him feels like it's being forced. And so there will be times where I'll do what I said in Isaiah 40 and I'll preach the grace of God and the, the graciousness of God towards sinners and the fact that we cannot save ourselves and we need to look to him. And I might do that without going to Christ. I reserve the right to do that. But pastorally, I'm feeling this burden as I think about the people in my church. Some of them don't know their Bibles. Every one of them has a fallen gravity pulling them towards independence. Some of them may not be alive next time I get explicit. Some of them may not be here next week. You know, all of those things are playing in my heart and making me think, I, I want to be as redemptive as I can. As I, can. I, I want to I show Jesus if I can. I, if I've got the option of talking about the graciousness of God or showing it in its ultimate form, I'm going to go that way. Sometimes I can't make it all that way without compromising the integrity of the text. But I can still be redemptive somewhere in that direction. I can still be pulling people towards Christ. And I hope that over the course of a ministry, over the course of the years of ministry, people would say, yeah, you know, there's maybe one or two exceptions, but basically when you preach, I'm drawn to Christ. You know, uh, there was that one time where, you know, you addressed the issue of gossip in the church and I felt a little bit like you're having a go at us. But, but generally, you know, and I think that's, that's what I want is that, that generally there's a consistency that people pick up without me saying, I always do this. I want people to have that sense. Man, when you preach, Christ gets bigger to me. God's grace, you know, pulls me out of the cloud of my selfishness. You know, those kind of things, that's, that's what I'm longing for. So, let's get to the menu. We've got some options, some approaches. First of all, some traditional approaches. Okay, so traditional approaches that work for some texts. There are textual approaches and there are typological approaches. So we're not going to dwell on these too much, but let me just uh, state what these are. The exposition of overt reference to Christ or his messianic work. Actually, those are really nice. It's not too hard to get to Jesus when Jesus is there. You know, so preaching the Gospels, it's possible to not do it. You know, we can turn even, you know, the crucifixion into a burden. But, but typically, you're preaching through and you, you get a Christophany. You know what that is? Where God is walking on two legs. Joshua 5. I, I don't think anyone argues with Joshua 5. Some people argue with all the others. I don't quite understand why. But if Jesus is there, if, if you're reading about him, that's not hard, you just preach the text. Old Testament predictions, 
a messianic psalm, Psalm 110. I hope you don't scratch your head for hours trying to work it out. It's, it's talking about him. Um, New Testament fulfillment, Gospels, the Epistles, Acts. I mean, it's not hard to get to Jesus once they're talking about him. You know? so, so those are just textual approaches. That's not what we're going to worry ourselves with this week. What about all the others? What about the passages that don't fit under that category? Well, there's the typological approach, and there are some legitimate types of Christ referenced in the New Testament. However, there's a lot of debate about whether it's appropriate to uh, multiply that approach into all the different details. And so, for example, you'll have uh, some specifics in um, Christ the Rock, who is Christ in Corinthians, things like that. And you go, oh, wow, didn't realize that when I was reading it. You know, why? Paul does it. He's inspired. Great. Everything else we see in the Old Testament suddenly becomes fair game. Uh, I don't think so. I really think we need to be careful with that. So we don't want to just copy that everywhere. Matthew 2's reference to Hosea 11, for example, God's uh, calling his son out of Egypt. People think they're copying that when they don't even understand it. <laughs> well, if God does it there, I can do the same thing. You know, I have called my son out of Egypt. I'm going to make that about Jesus. That's not actually what's going on there. If you look at it closely, Matthew is looking back and he's understanding Hosea and it's the, the informing theology, the context and everything that's gone into that. The, the New Testament writers handle the Old Testament absolutely incredibly well. Our problem is we don't understand it well enough to see what they're doing sometimes and we just copy it without doing the work they did or without knowing the text like they did. And so just because... Hosea 11 doesn't look like it's pointing forward to Christ, it's obviously pointing back to Egypt and Israel coming out, we think, well, anything pointing back we can make about Jesus. No. Matthew's looking at that and saying there's a pattern, there's a theme, there's an idea, there's a concept, and now that's fulfilled here, and he's doing it really legitimately does not give us the right to go through the Old Testament and spot every backwards reference and change its direction. Okay, so typologically we need to be careful. Okay, it's, it's easy. Honestly, it's not clever. It's easy and sometimes it's ridiculous to read a story and to just find a way to turn it into Jesus. Jesus is our Technicolor dream code. Jesus is our you know, greater tent peg. Jesus is our silver socket. Jesus is our, you know, you can, you can do that. And sometimes there's a, an element of legitimacy to it. Often, and I would say often, even when it's legitimate, it still looks like magic. You know, so sometimes there are legitimate ways to get from a text to Christ. And I choose not to use them because from the perspective of the listener, I don't have an hour and a half to prove it. You know, so sometimes I'll go with something that's a bit more general rather than a specific because I can't, I can't, make sh I, I can't convince them that that's genuinely true. I've spent hours and hours reading commentaries and wrestling with the text and looking at the Hebrew and, and I'm convinced that's there. I, I don't want to just do the magic, even if technically it's not magic. Do you see what I mean? So I, I want to be careful and I think we should all basically be careful with typology. And you probably do well to pretty much not do it. Generally don't go there. Okay? But let's look at some positives, some, some that I think really, okay, here's a menu. And here are the four options that I want us to, to get to grips with a little bit today as I kind of blast it at you, but then tomorrow as we do some practicing. We're going to look at a passage in a group tomorrow and you're going to be saying, huh, Okay, yep, I'm, all right, I've got the passage. Now then, does option A work? Meh, yeah, kind of. How about option B? I can't see any way to do option B here. Can you? No, I can't see any way to do option B. What about option C? Yeah, option C is pretty good. We could do option C with verse 17. Do you see how that works? Oh, okay, is that legitimate? Well, let's think about it. Option D? Hmm, yeah, that one seems to be... Yeah. And that's the kind of conversation you're going to have tomorrow is looking at a text and thinking, okay, which way can I show that this text is redemptive? All right, so here are the options. Redemptive historical, number one. Doctrinal, number two. 
a literary motif number three and relational number four. So let's go through those and make sense of them. Uh, some of these are bigger picture, some of these are more detail oriented. Okay, and some texts will give you a lovely detail, some texts fit in a bigger story. So that's kind of a, a broad question you're asking yourself with any passage is, is there something within this or is, is the issue where this sits? You know, so let me, even before we get into the specifics, let's just do a little test here. Okay, um, what's your first impulse in terms of where it, f is it, is it going to be a detail within or is it going to be where it fits in the big story? If the passage is, say, uh, I'm trying to think of a really one-sided one, um, God's covenant with David to put his descendant on the throne. Big or a detail within it? It's going big, isn't it? It's, it's pointing towards the future. It's like, ooh, now there's details there. But it, it's, it's kind of leaning that way. What about Abraham sacrificing his son on Mount Moriah? What do you think? Is it yeah, there's lots. You, it feels like there's stuff within it, doesn't it? He's sacrificing his son on the mountain. We know where the mountain is. You know, there's 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 stuff there. It just feels like it's probably going to give us some some options, right? Now, technically, you might go, "No, hang on a minute." There's also a big picture here because Abraham's part of this line, and and this is kind of the culmination of his story. And so, actually, yeah, we've. We've got options there, but even before we get into the specifics of different ways of doing it, some passages are already yielding a kind of a, ooh, or a, ooh, you know, kind of a, a tendency for us. So the biggest sort of big picture one is the redemptive historical. That is, this passage is part of the big story and is an obvious way in which it is. Okay, so it's a macro approach. It identifies the place or the function of a text in the broader redemptive history. So it could be a positive or a bridge text, such as, um, uh, well, let me give the description. Events, patterns, or persons advancing our understanding of God's redemptive plan. It's the kind of stuff that if you were going to say to someone, or someone says to you, I've got half an hour, walk me through the Old Testament and how it leads us to Christ. You've got half an hour, you're not going to get into minute detail, but you are going to step on certain stepping stones, right? Adam, you know, the think of covenants, Abraham, Moses, David, you know, those kind of stepping stones. You might add a few more, Melchizedek. Uh, you know, there's, there's kind of ones that are pointing us on. It's like, take step here, okay. Now step here, okay. You know, so it's those kind of passages are going to be the positive ones that are almost like, a set of street signs pointing us forward to the coming deliverer. Genesis 3.15 is one. And everything that kind of flows out, sort of the red line through Scripture. Those are going to be the positive texts or the bridge texts that move us from one era to the next with that forward momentum. Okay? But there's also negative or dead-end texts, i.e. Uh, cul-de-sacs, roads that don't take us towards Christ, but there's a lesson in that, okay? So events, patterns, or persons demonstrating a false hope for a redemption by human means. So where the people are going, yeah, and then a few years later they're going, Ugh. those are all part of the progression. So I, what did I put on there? The law. If you take the law as a means of salvation, it's a dead end. The monarchy. If you think, oh, you know, just... There's quite a few of them, actually. Think about when um, David had a son after God had promised. <gasps> Is this him? Well, Solomon's a bit of a dead end, <laughs> you know? And so there's, there's that, uh, the first child of Eve. Remember God's promise, Genesis 3.15? Then you come to Genesis 4, verse 1. Uh, they've been put out of the garden. Adam knew Eve. She conceived and gave birth to a son. And what was her response to that? God's given me a man. Like she's thinking, this is it, this is it. 
Like, I, I know my Bible, and I know Genesis 3.15, and here we are in Genesis 4.1, this must be him. And that was an absolute dead end, wasn't it? Instead of pointing us to Christ, we see how terrible fallen this is. And so even that, if you're preaching Genesis 4.1, the first part of Genesis 4, you're working your way through, there's the promise, there's the anticipation, and here's a false hope. The answer's got to be something more than a son who's just in the same image, with the same sin nature, who's going to kill his brother or whatever, you know, just the mess of Genesis 4 is pointing us to Christ by saying this is not the answer to Genesis 3.15. Okay, so uh, redemptive historical, the obvious ones tend to be those stepping stones of the red line, but also the deviations that take us off track. The, the false dawns, the, the empty promises, the, those are all part of, and sometimes you look at a passage, you say, well, there's no detail within this passage, but the way this passage works within its story, hmm. you know, it's, it's taking us away from, and it gives you a chance to preach that line of anticipation. So, redemptive historical is going to be a way to go with key passages, especially ones that are linking backwards to a promise, forwards to a fulfillment, that sort of thing. So, you know, things like um, details within the promise plan coming together, entering into the land. That might be a kind of a, a section where it, it, the way to preach redemptively is, you know, hey, that it's not... It's not that these people are earning this, God's giving them this because it's part of his big plan to give. You know, there's, there's different ways to, to do it, but, but you're, you're kind of focused somehow within your preaching of a passage that you're using that approach with is going to be to give the big story. Okay, tying back to 3.15 or to the covenants or whatever, anticipating Christ, and you may just point forward or you may go there and show the fulfillment. But it's going to be a kind of a sermon where this text does this. All right, there's a bigness to it. But then you come to some of the kind of more zeroed in options within the text. Number two there is the doctrinal, doctrinal, theological. That's where uh, it's a micro approach. So it's within the text. There's something there that explains and emphasizes a redact uh, a redemptive doctrine exemplified, stated or taught in the immediate text. So, what do I mean by that? The whole plan of God culminating in the atonement at Calvary makes sense because of some building blocks of redemptive truth. Like We wouldn't understand the cross if we didn't have the background of the sacrifices. All right, so, Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16. Two goats, the scapegoat that goes off and the goat that's killed. And there's, there's all of that explanation going on within that. And you might say, yeah, Jesus is, the, uh, you know, Jesus is the one that's killed. Jesus is the ultimate atonement. This must be redemptive historical. But actually, it may be within the detail of that text, being able to explain how it is that this innocent goat can bear the sins of the people in God's system, maybe that is the way to be preaching Christ. Do you see what I mean? It's not that, oh, this is just an anticipation. It's not, here's an explanation of a, of a feature with the priest putting his head on the, hands on the head and praying over it and they, the goat is kind of bearing the sins and carrying them away so that you, they can't be seen anymore and carrying them away by losing its blood. You know, that's part of the way God has revealed all the way through Scripture that atonement costs blood. The life is in the blood. Leviticus 17, following up on that. It, there's, there's these kind of elements where you go, you know what? If we really get that, we're getting something about the atonement. And so maybe that's the kind of thing that might work with Abraham and Isaac. And so it's not, you could go redemptive historical, and maybe that's legitimate to say, look, Abraham, 
is the father who, of the faithful, and you know, you've got this whole line, that's an awkward phrase, but you know what I mean. You know, Abraham's the one who receives the promise, and here's the point. We know Genesis 15 is where he finally believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Here's where that faith manifests properly for the first time, subsequent to it, in 22. And he is the one that's pointing us to Christ. And it could be that you go big story, but actually, it could be that you go, yeah, yeah, I accept that, but offering his son and being willing to kill his own son, my goodness, that's too good to miss. Now, what's interesting about that is in the Gospels, they don't use it. Douglas Moo, uh, you've probably heard of Douglas Moo, commentator, he did his PhD on um, New Testament use of the Old Testament in the Passion Narratives. And he's looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And one of the things he brings out in his PhD is, surprisingly, Genesis 22 is not quoted. It feels like it's sitting up for it, and yet it's not quoted. But there's tons of Zechariah and Psalms and other things. And so you might say, well, no, I don't, I don't think I should go that way. But really, I kind of think you would. It's, it's hard. Do you see what I mean? It's really hard to... Elements within it. God, him, God will provide himself... Uh, for a ram, you know, th those kind of things you go, oh, this, this is too rich, this is too gospel -y. you know, and so th maybe you go theologically, I'm going to allow that to come out and point beyond this story to that one. But it's not so much this is a linking text as this is a revealing, explaining text of what happens later. Okay, so that's what we mean by doctrinal. Number three is similar but different. Number three is a literary motif. So it's not a theological concept so much as a detail within the text that is sitting up to point us to God's redemption. So this uses both micro detail and macro awareness, that's fun, um, to recognize an authorially intended literary motif within the text that prefigures or echoes an aspect of Christ's redemp redemptive redeeming work. So, notice that within that I say authorially intended. This does not give us scope to make really bizarre connections. This is what the author, human may be divine certainly, intended to be understood within the text. Um, so, for example, and this is where maybe you go with the Abraham one, Abraham offering his only son whom he loved on Mount Moriah and then God doing the same. So you preach Genesis 22, and that language, you know, I'm thinking there specifically of the introduction. Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac, and sacrifice him for me on, to me on Mount Moriah. That, that is unusual, right? Literarily, within biblical text, you don't tend to get that level of specificity. It's a very deliberate kind of slowing down and zeroing in and focusing on. He could have just said, take Isaac and kill him. But instead he says, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac. It's, whoa. Even just reading it, it's kind of like, wow. And maybe you kind of take that, you tell the story, and then you, you kind of say, well, you can't help but think that language of the very unique one-of-a-kind, only-begotten son kind of concept. Doesn't that make us think of John 3? You know, God gave his only-begotten son. And so that's, that's a literary approach that would take you from Genesis 22 to John 3 in the conclusion of your message. I think that's legitimate. You know, I think that's deliberate language. I don't think that's forcing it. You could do it doctrinally and say, um, take the concept of sacrifice for sin and then go to Jesus. So both of those would be options. I think I'd lean towards the literary approach a little bit more because there are other passages that are stronger on the explanation of sacrifice for sin. This is a sacrifice, but it's a little bit of a confusing one. It's sort of, sort of a test of faith sacrifice and so maybe I'm not going to go with the sacrifice for sin in Genesis 22 I'm going to do that when I get to Leviticus 16 
In Genesis 22, the only son. Oh, that's the, maybe that's where I'm going. And so you see what we're doing. We're evaluating. And with Genesis 22, we've already got all three options as legitimate. Because of who Abraham is, it's part of the big story. It's a key moment in his life, therefore it's a linking text. But is that as good as the, wow, sacrifice, sacrifice, Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah. Oh, I don't know, maybe that's better. Hang on, no, that literary one feels stronger. But we're evaluating, and you could say, no, no, no. I, I, I do think the doctrinal one, maybe that unique sacrifice test of faith thing is important. And so... It's going to be a subjective discussion, but the point is we're trying to zero in on what's the best way, and you might take two, you might combine a couple, but what's the way to get the redemptive force of this text revealed to my listeners? Are we tracking so far? There's one more. Okay, relational. Now, um, certain preachers will tend to certain categories. So there are some people that are redemptive historical in everything they say, sometimes brilliantly, sometimes forcing it. <coughs> okay, but there are some preachers in that D category who are very much big story kind of emphasis, and that's the way they do it. They always show how it ties to that story. There are others who always or often bring out a doctrinal theological element. I think Carson has, tends to go a bit that way, where there's like, Notice this truth, you know, and then, that, that, you know, that's, some people go that way. Some people do something quite often where they zero in on the text and they spot a little sort of trigger. Keller, I think, is, is probably one of the best known for doing that because he's actually exegetically very precise. He's looking at the text, he's looking at it in the original language, he's thinking about it, and he's going, oh, here's a link. Now, sometimes not saying Keller, but sometimes people make links that are impossible to understand. And that's where I would say, even if it's legitimate, don't. Pull back slightly and just say, hang on, well, people get this. But, but there are good ways to do that. And so there's, there's people in each kind of category that, not every time, but if you want someone who's going to do a uh, literary motif, fairly frequently look at Keller. If you're going to look at the doctrinal, you know, go to Carson or somebody. If you're going to think redemptive historical, Clowney and others. So there's people that kind of fit within one of these more often maybe than some of us would who have the freedom to choose a little bit more. Andrew? Literary motif and the typology. Yeah. Authorial intent, I would say, is the, the distinction. So sometimes within a text there is a detail that is legitimately there that just kind of gets your attention if you have eyes to see it. And it's in some way pointing to some aspect of, you know, what God's doing. Typology doesn't need it to be deliberate. It takes any detail. And do you see that that's, that's kind of the difference? The typology um, versus literary motif. The typology doesn't have to be there. It doesn't have to be intended. You just have to come up with it. Allegory, typology, analogy, they can all, there's, a, there's a lot of overlap there. But it's, it's typically treated as a typological explanation or a typological link. So technically, yeah, allegory and analogy are slightly different, and you know, but those, those things in their illegitimate form, let me be clear, when they're done poorly, do not require it to be there. When it's like, you know, the rock that is Christ, you know, one that you can't argue with because it's stated as such scripturally, that's not making something up, that's legitimately supposed to be seen that way. And so there, there are ways of doing that sort of typological, analogical, allegorical approach legitimately. Where I treat that as a sort of illegitimate approach is what I responded to you, Andrew, where you say, well, literary motif isn't giving you freedom to be ultimately creative. It's saying to you, know your Bible well enough that you can start to spot these things. You know, and so there's sometimes there's things that you've read your Bible 20 times you haven't seen yet, but they're still there. They've always been there, and in the end you might see them, you know, and some sort of keywords or intriguing ways of phrasing <coughs> things that the author is, is, is using. Now, it may not be that the author knows where it's going, but the divine author does. And so the more we know our Bibles, the better we're going to get at literary motif stuff. I suppose you could say the better we know our theology, the more we're going to spot the doctrinal stuff. I'm not sure so much on that one. 
but uh, it's those kind of you know specifics so what have I put on here uh, Moses striking the rock to rescue the people as Christ was struck to rescue his people Numbers 14 1 Corinthians 10 I would say that the literary motif approach is one to hold with humility until you are you know Keller Carson level until you know your Bible inside and out, backwards and forwards, Hebrew and Greek, you know, if you're like an absolute Bible expert, then hopefully your character will be such that you'll be very humble, right? Until then, be humble, because it's not helpful to go, yep, got it, bang, you know, and just be really uber confident and then discover you're kind of getting it wrong. You're making a point that doesn't stand because the original language doesn't support it or something. So there needs to be a sort of a, uh, a graciousness, a humility, a care when it comes to literary motif or typological, analogical, allegorical type approaches. Just humility has to be really a big deal, especially in that approach, because if you're proved wrong, you've undermined your message. And that's awkward. You know, it's kind of awkward to preach something and discover that it was wrong, technically wrong, you know. And so be careful with it. And that's where commentaries are going to be really helpful. If you're seeing something and you're saying, here's a word that's used again later, ah, you know, and you get excited and no commentator mentions it, it might be that you're just getting overexcited about the word the or something. <laughs> you know, the fact that there's a the in Genesis 22 and there's a the in John 3 doesn't mean that's the point. You know, that's just you spotting a common word. But sometimes, you know, and yeah, I, I think that example is a good one. Your son, the, the one you love, your only son, Isaac, take him. You know, that's an emphasis within the text that's undisputable that then seems like it sits up for a specific loved son to be kind of become a thing later in the story. The last category, honestly, is the one I tend to use more frequently, more easily. And if you want a proper name to go with it, Brian Chappell tends to use this one. And that's the relational approach. And so it's a micro approach, so it's focusing in within the text and it's saying, look, uh, grace principles expressed in God's relational interactions with people. Here's a character, whether you're in Genesis or in Esther or wherever, here's a character who is living either by faith or unfaith. Right? Whether it's explicit or implicit, they're either trusting God or they're trusting self. There's nobody that's, that's sort of um, excused from that distinction. Everybody is either trusting God or trusting self at any point in the story. Therefore, within that story, you can find and then present some aspect of the redemptive nature of God's character. For instance, his strength in their weakness. Uh, his faithfulness amidst their unfaithfulness. Esther being a great example of that. The unstated God who doesn't forget his own people who don't mention him. You know, that God's the hero of Esther, even though he's never explicitly mentioned. Um, so his faithfulness, their unfaithfulness. His forgiveness for sin, their sin. Those kind of things, you know, they're aspects of the whole story. They're not the whole story. And they don't have to take us all the way to Jesus to be legitimately, isn't it great that God's like this? It's, it's presenting an aspect. You know, even when they are hopeless, God provides a deliverer. Even when they sin, God is willing to forgive. Even when they are weak, God is able to give strength, you know, or God willing to give strength. You know, and so it's these kind of factors. This approach always directs us to the first two foundational questions. As in, I wrote a book called Foundations that has some questions in it. So the first two, what is God like? What is a human like? What is God? What is man? What is mankind? Those are the basic, basic questions for every bit of theology we ever do. And every text we're reading, whether it's narrative, whether it's a glimpse into a narrative through poetry, or whether it's a glimpse into a narrative through discourse, epistle, and so on, or a speech, any type of text has a narrative sense to it, a narrative context, Every single narrative, which means the entire Bible, by my definition that's very broad there, every single text is saying something about God and something about humans. Right? Always. 
There's a fallen condition focus that's either explicit or implicit. And there is a gracious goodness of God, redemptively inclined God, either explicit or implicit. And so as we look at the characters engaging with God, whether they're engaging like, you know, faithful Joshua or like faithless Jezebel, it's God and a character. As we look at that, it's revealing to us something of the answer to those two questions, God, human. And therefore, it can be redemptive. So I think, for me, and that's why I underlined it, this is the most frequent and important approach to use. It's almost like a catch-all. I look at a text and I think, is this a bridge text? Is this a key text? Is this this one of those kind of stepping stones through the Old Testament texts? If it's not, if it is, great, keep looking. If it's not, keep looking. Okay, is there something within this that's revealing an aspect of the theology of the atonement? of God's dealings with humanity to bring us back to him. If there is, great. If there, and I keep looking, but if there isn't, okay, I'm going to keep looking. I always want to look for all of them because I can then evaluate. Okay, is there anything literarily within this text that is kind of a, a trigger to, to say, hey, don't miss this. If there is, great, keep looking. If there isn't, keep looking. And finally, okay, relationally, how are these people interacting with God? And I know it's there. You see, that's the benefit of that fourth one. I know there's some sense in which there's a divine human intersection going on in a fallen world with a saving God. And so then, once I've done that, I've got my options. There may be none of the first or none of the third or whatever. Okay, that's easy. Don't use that. Then I've got several, maybe several left. Which ones are stronger than others? Which ones are more specific to this text than others? Just as an experienced preacher, I might go, I'm really fascinated by that literary one. That's, whoa, I've never seen that before. I don't know how I'd explain it. (laughs) So even just as a preacher, I might be saying, I love it, but thank you, Lord. You know, whichever way you're going, and you go, do I combine these two? Do I emphasize one? Sometimes I've been preaching a passage where there's three approaches that are all legitimate, but I don't have an hour and 20 minutes. I have... 30 minutes, 35 minutes. I can't do justice to three. It would be better to just do one well. So there's there's some preaching wisdom coming into this. But basically, you're looking at the four options, finding out which ones are legitimate for this passage, which ones feel like, yeah, that has credibility. And then you're evaluating which is the way to go.